So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first graduate research series presentation of the fall 2021 semester. I'm Janet Holm, Assistant Dean for Collections and Digitization Strategies for the University Libraries, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Each year, the University Libraries, in partnership with Graduate Student Senate, welcomes applications from graduate students who wish to present their research process for the graduate research series. I'm honored to introduce today's presenter, Ritika Popley, a doctoral candidate of rhetoric and culture. Her dissertation explores the intricate relationships shared between history and memory in the digital landscape with a focus on digital oral history archives ded dedicated to archiving witness accounts of the partition of British India in 1947. Focusing on public memory, borders, and archives, her research investigates how emergent digital projects are altering and remaking the event of partition in the virtual digital space. Please join me in welcoming Ritika, who will share her research process with us today. Welcome, Ritika. Hi, um, thank you everyone, first off, for being here and uh, taking our time on a Monday afternoon to spend some time listening to my research. Um, obviously, I'm very grateful and very rather deeply grateful um, to Alden Library, which for many of us is almost like our second home and the Graduate Student Senate uh, for providing this fantastic opportunity to graduate students to be able to not just share our research, but also create this forum for uh, hopefully what, what everyone is hoping to be a meaningful discussion. And also, uh, I hope I can gather some feedback that can add to my dissertation as I'm in the process of writing it. So thank you for being here and thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to start off um, and uh, I've timed it, so it's not going to be hopefully too long, so I won't bore you too much. But um, as you can see on your screens right now, uh, that's the title of my dissertation as it's ongoing. Um, the Digital Afterlives of India's Partition, Memories and Borders. And as Janet has very kindly introduced me, I'm a doctoral candidate. I'm a fourth year student in the School of Communication Studies, of course, at uh, OU. Uh, just to start off, um, the sort of large, broad question that I'm looking at in my dissertation is in what ways really are digital archives in terms of structure, form, and various projects, which I'll introduce you to in just some time, uh, involved in remaking, making, altering the heritage that many in South Asia have received and world over called this event, historical event called partition. So that's sort of this large overarching question that influences or triggers the way in which I think about my project. Um, so there are, of course, various like in all research projects, there is some significance to conducting this sort of research. So one of the main questions is um, to that I'm thinking through is how can we sort of further understand the very intricate relationship that memory and history making share, but in the digital realm. And just because it is digital in nature, does that influence it, change it, not change it? So those kinds of questions. Of course, we already know for those of us who come from humanities and the arts, we know that there is already um, in some um, symbiotic relationship between memory and history making. But what really happens to that in when it goes into the digital realm? Uh, I also think that the work advances uh, or pre-existing work that is already available to us on archives, borders, memory, oral history, and of course, rhetorical studies, which is my home in the global south. Um, just to kind of take you very briefly of how the presentation is going to look like or the next 20 minutes, um, I'll obviously be introducing my dissertation, take you through the broad research questions that I'm looking at. I'll also give you a glimpse of behind the scenes in terms of how I arrived at the dissertation, which has been a long sort of longitudinal commitment to this project. Then I'll introduce you to the idea of the digital oral history archive. And then, of course, I'll conclude with how the library and Alden in particular have uh, been very beneficial and uh, important for conducting this research and just in general, because uh, it's sort of a meta situation here because I know there are many archivists and library uh, librarians present in the audience. And of course, this is supported by Alden Library and the work is looking really at the structure of archives. So it's sort of a very interesting moment to present this kind of work. Um, so for those of us who are in the audience who might be unfamiliar uh, with the historical context, I'll just briefly introduce you to it. Um, so the partition of British India, of course, as as you may already know, happened in 1947. So what really in essence happened, right? So partition is this critical moment in South Asian history 
that rendered 1 million people dead and forcibly uh, displaced an estimated 15 to 20 million people under very tragically violent circumstances that led to the creation of India. East Pakistan, which today uh, currently in current days known as Bangladesh and West Pakistan, which in current days known as Pakistan. Uh, mass scale killings, women, children often were the very site of this unprecedented violence that was religious or communal in nature. So it was mostly um, a fight, sort of this violence erupted between Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs. So these were the three sort of community among which the violence took place. Um, there were rapes, genital mutilation, sort of very horrific instances of violence that were happening across the northern, western, eastern parts of the of the subcontinent. So in the last decade, almost 70 years after partition, uh, there have been sort of several projects that have come up in the digital space um, that are committed to collecting, preserving through, of course, recording and in the form of oral history archiving and also curating these memories of first-hand partition witnesses and survivors. Now, there are several ways in which this is happening and technology is also being deployed in several ways in doing this. Uh, also, just to um, give you further context, um, the moment of partition coincides when the continent also gains independence from the British rule in 1947. So several historians would say oh, over 200 years of rule, but almost the first 100 years went into the British trying to uh, gain a sort of gain claim on the subcontinent and then the next 100 years they ruled um, over the subcontinent area and then that moment when decolonization formal decolonization happens coincides with the very tragic event of partition so it's all also a very interesting moment in history in that sense um, now the digital sort of nature, uh, and like I said, it's happening in various ways, right? So like for my dissertation, I'm specifically looking at the digital oral history archive. I'm looking at projects that are only solely committed to oral history or collection of primary memories. However, having said that, there are also a couple of other projects that are happening that I'm not looking at in the dissertation, but just to give you a scope of the work that is going on. So like there's, for instance, there's a very interesting project called the Project Dastan, which uses virtual reality to um, sort of reconnect people from across the borders. And uh, for those of you who might be unfamiliar, in the, the borders that India-Pakistan share are quite um, tense geopolitically. So these are two nuclear armed countries that are constantly uh, in a moment sort of can erupt into a war and that's happened thrice before. We have since in uh, since independence. So it's also interesting in that sense because these are these are really geo very not just tense borders, but they're also not a porous in that sense. But the border that India shares with Bangladesh, what was earlier known as East Pakistan, um, is very porous in that sense. So it's also uh, different sort of areas of geographically have very different ways in which the border operates. But so a project like uh, uh, Project Dasta would say that using virtual reality uh, and all of these are part of the South Asian diaspora. So they, they, that also kind of helps them to trans sort of transverse the border and travel across the border. Would sort of, for instance, if I if I know someone who's witnessed partition, let's say New Delhi in India, wants to go uh, see their home that they were displaced from in Lahore in Pakistan. So Project Dasta would help you do that through virtual reality. So members of the team would actually travel to Lahore. If you give them exactly sort of, I you know, some sort of location that, oh, this was where I lived, this was the village, this is, you know, there was a temple next to my house or there was a small Sikh temple next to my house. They'll travel, record that entire area for you or the home if it still exists in whatever way or what it looks like today, bring back that recording and using VR technology, show you your home. So in a way, the promise is that you can cross these closed frontiers in the digital space. So giving you positioning these projects for you. Uh, but of course, like I said, I'm not really this is part of the future research. But in a sense, like all of this is also going on in very interesting things. Um, now, the digital nature also opens up possibilities on this renewed sort of comprehensions of the relationship between the past and the present and focusing on public memory, borders and archives. I'm trying to examine the form of the digital archive in itself. And if the form of the digital archive really illuminates and sort of organizes, reorganizes this past present relationship, which is critical to the historical project and in turn, of course, to rhetorical studies. Now, um, 
in a in a sort of nutshell, the dissertation is really examining the politics of memorialization of partition narratives of British India in 1947 in the digital landscape. Uh, like I've already mentioned to you, several sort of these archives and projects have emerged in the last decade doing this kind of work. Um, now, if we have to also giving you a little theoretical background of how I sort of come make these relationships between archives, borders and rhetorical studies. So how am I situating it all, all together? So if we really have to map a turn when the archive and this might be interesting for those of us who are already invested in archival studies uh, goes from being simply a neutral repository of artifacts, objects for examination. And today we know that the archive simply isn't neutral. It is an objective. We know that there is a politics at play that goes on in selection of the material in curation of those materials. So uh, sort of that moment when that turn shift happens is really a postmodern influences that when we start thinking of archives as objects to archives as process. And here I'm borrowing from Laura Ann Stoller's incredible work on colonial archives. So for those of us who also study this may already be familiar that one of the sort of most significant scholars who work influences this, especially in the postmodern context is Derrida's archive fever that he writes, uh, which we get an English translation of from French in 1995, is that key text where Derrida also, of course, as Derrida would in several ways provides us to think of the archive, but really he's trying to sort of shift that focus and say that, yeah, like we have to start thinking and considering of the archive really as a source of power. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm the, this is one of the readings of Derrida as uh, there would be several others. Um, now, postmodern approaches to, towards archive, like I said, are sort of largely responsible for the archival turn. Um, now, archives then also become sites where struggles over memory, history are, are happening and are very integral to the premise of engaging in constant historical and narrative revisions. So that's also sort of the base from where my dissertation moves further. Um, now, in the context of studies, the archive has been approached, of course, in several ways. Uh, the archive has been looked at uh, as a point which elicits polysemic meanings, uh, silences, erasures, right? If rhetoric, if we really truly understand rhetoric to be as something that is making uh, absence present or like really defining relationship between knowledge, opinion, belief on one hand uh, to sort of knowledge systems on the other. So like uh, really in essence, archives have a potential rhetorical force that they represent within the context of memory and sort of to put that further the fluidity of archival memory and its openness to emergent and even contradictory social and political uses sort of points us towards processes of interpretation and meaning making and that becomes very key to my project um now sort of three broad research questions that I'm looking at. So the first one I've already introduced you to um, in what ways are the digital archives and projects or the oral, the digital oral history uh, archive involved in remaking, altering this inheritance that we have called the partition or the heritage called partition. It has a history right of these long 70 years behind it too. Uh, and secondly, what role do digital archives and projects play in shaping partition history or Going further, how might the event of partition itself impact the way we uh, the digital archives and these projects have shaped up? So sort of looking at that uh, play here too. Then third is how are borders really understood in this dim emergent digital landscape in relation to partition? Now borders are pretty key to the study of partition. I mean, like I've already explained to you how um, it was literally the division of land and the creation of new borders. So for partition studies, the, the in, emphasis on borders has been immense and has been looked at in several ways. Um, and then, of course, borders also becomes very important to rhetorical studies. So all three areas, borders, public memory, archives are all sort of important for rhetorical studies and obviously key to my own project. Uh, now, how did I arrive at the dissertation, right? Um, so uh, right after my master's and as, I, as you can see, this is me six years ago, shorter hair, younger. Um, I uh, sort of looked up, uh, I was figuring out what to do with life as many people do after getting a master's in in, in, in sort of humanities. Um, so 
I looked up and there was this project called the 1947 Partition Archive and they were looking for citizen historians to go around and do sort of this memory collection work or what they sort of uh, position as oral history work and interview uh, partition witnesses and survivors. So this image is actually from 2015 and uh, this was a paid fellowship. So I thought, why not? And of course, uh, I have a personal investment in partition to my parents from uh, paternal grandparents actually uh, come from uh, Pakistan. My uh, paternal grandfather comes from this very small village called Ahmadpur Sirkia in Multan region, which is the southern part of Pakistan. And my grandmother uh, migrated from Lahore. Now, um, I couldn't sort of, I don't really have much information about my father, my grandfather's side of the journey, but I, I have listened to my grandmother growing up um, and she would very often tell us of these very horrific memories of traveling in a train and she had a very sort of difficult uh, time and she was a child back then but the family faced a lot of violence while trying to migrate from Lahore to uh, Amritsar in India which is a very short trip like it's barely an hour or by uh, on road but it, it was very hard during that time in the midst of all of these riots and violence that was going on to kind of make that journey. Um, so a lot of work around partition and it's not unusual emerges from personal experiences. So we already have a lot of memoirs, fiction, non -write, fiction writing, cinema, photography that has already been done around partition and of course oral history work too, which is critical to partition work. Um, now, like I said, so I saw this project and I thought it might be interesting to kind of like engage with it and see what comes out of it. And so during the summer of uh, 2015, like uh, about January to June, I actually spent a lot of time uh, with uh, interviewing oral history uh, partition witnesses and survivors in Delhi. That's where I'm from. I was born and raised there. So New Delhi and its surrounding areas. So that's really when I very uh, deeply started thinking about these projects. And for me, it was like something else is also at play here. Now, all of these projects um, are based around the world, uh, but sort of the majority of them are based in the US. And the project, the 1947 Partition Archive, which is sort of the more uh, the big sort of project on this, they have managed to collect more than 9,500 uh, witness testimonies from around the world over 10, 12 years. And so that's actually that was born out of Berkeley. And like I said, the South Asian diaspora is very deeply involved in this work and majority of the work is being done by them. So again, interesting politics in that sense sort of at play here. And uh, so then after working as an oral historian for them in the field with the archive, I also sort of then went into the behind the scenes. I was doing fundraising for them, organized a uh, lot of traveling exhibitions, so on and so forth. So about for two years, I was very committed to working with the archive. And then that's the moment I sort of realized that maybe there is more to be investigated here and think about it really. And then that's how the PhD came into being. So just sort of giving you a sense of the sort of longitudinal commitment to the archives. And I've been thinking about them and how I really arrive at the, at the dissertation. Um, also, so what I call the digital oral history archive, and these are my sites of analysis projects that I'm looking at. Uh, yeah, so like I've already mentioned to you, if you can see on your screens on the bottom left is the 1947 partition archive. That's their website. All of these projects are hosted on their website. Um, so that's the uh, project that I was working with. And so now you can see that this is a screenshot from just two, three days ago. So the stories that they managed to collect is, uh, or at least they made available are 9,275. Now, of course, a majority of them, as one would assume, comes from the subcontinent, but they've also managed to collect a sizable sort of a reasonable chunk from um, the US and uh, UK. That's also where a lot of the South Asian diaspora sort of lives today. Um, and then there are two other projects that have also been involved in collecting oral history um, testimonies, survivor testimonies. So then there's the other second project that I'm looking at is called the Citizens Archive of India that is physically based in Mumbai, but of course, again, uh, completely digital in nature. And uh, their project is called the Generation 1947 project. Uh, the only sort of the difference between the archive and this is not just in terms of size, the archive is sort of the 1947 partition archive is the biggest project out of all three. But the, the other project, they're also um, so very in invested in collecting photographs or any kind of personal artifacts that the interviewee might would want to share and uh, they digitize that and store it as well. Um, so 
the both these projects are uh, essentially looking also at what they call life history. So it's not just the oral history, the moment of partition. How traditionally oral historians would kind of go about doing that work, thinking through like, okay, so this event happens, and then we kind of interview people around that event and try to construct sort of memories and you know research emerges from that. But the Generation 1947 project, 1947 partition archive, and the third one is the Citizens Archive of Pakistan. All three of them are also sort of conducting these long um, life histories. So you're not just asking people about their memories of partition or the moment of partition, but you're also asking them very deeply about their lives pre-partition, lives post-partition, also sort of playing into this idea of nation building, right? So these how, how are these post-colonial nation states coming up? What happens then, right? But how does modernity sort of set in here and like what really works here? So it's sort of interesting things are going on, not just like the moment of partition, but also they are building up relationships between independence partition and kind of that those kind of relations. The third project that I'm looking at um, is the, as I mentioned, is the Citizens Archive of Pakistan. They have a very singular project called the Oral History Project. They're also doing a lot of other things, but uh, part, sort of collecting partition witnesses, uh, their stories is key to their entire sort of gambit of projects. Um, again, the, the Citizens Archive Pakistan is actually very similar to Citizens Archive of India and they also work together. So there are many times that they'll host exhibitions together, they'll host talks together, invite people, also a lot of cross border work happening in that sense. Um, I thought it might be interesting for me to also share with you um, a story that this uh, 1947 partition archive actually uh, has made visible, uh, sort of has uploaded on their YouTube channel. Um, like they are, of course, they're, they have these massive sort of like, right, they have about 9000 plus stories, but they a uh, few years ago sort of curated and edited a few stories and put them up on YouTube to kind of give a taste to people that how really are they um, uh, collecting these stories and what they look like, the form of the story. Um, just to give you a preview, the story that I'm going to show you is of this migrant called Shani Ali. Um, and he talks about his experience of what he witnessed during partition, but this is a very heavily edited video. Uh, and I think the archive made it as sort of a corporate pitch to the New York Times to sort of write about them and a couple of other publications. This was years ago, but uh, that's not how the stories look like if you really go into the archive. They're very, they're unedited, they're raw, they're six hours long. Sometimes they span over three days, sometimes they're an hour short. So that's, this is just a very edited version of one of the oral history, like what would it look like? Um, I think you should be able to see. Yeah. Just pausing. Jen, are you able to hear the, the sound? Yes, we can see and hear it. Thank you. Okay. One morning we were sleeping and uh, there was a loud voices. So there we saw, I saw thousands of people surrounding the village with the arms. Then my uncle came running. So he took us to the center of the village. He said to go into that room and stay there. And all the village women and children were in that room. After about maybe two, three hours, which was like an eternity for us. Somebody banged on the door and the guy shouted that open the door, otherwise we will uh, fire inside and set the room in fire. So they told us to sit under a, a big tree and they start killing. My cousin got shot and then my brother, he saw what was going on, so he started running. The spear and hit him. So my mother saw that and she ran after him. So she fell over him and uh, they both were killed there. I was very traumatized. I was standing there not knowing what's happening. He, the gunman was only about 10 feet away sort of, you know, he shot at me a few times every time he missed. So I started running there. One uh, guy came 
with a spear. He tried to kill me. In the meantime, I, I, I bumped into the other guy. He was killing too. The other guy came to kill. He said, no, don't kill him. And uh, the guy said, why not? And he, the one who was holding me, he said, no, I want to take this uh, uh, child with me. We were traveling and I was always wondering what's going to happen to me and where he's taking me. He didn't explain to me anything. We walked two nights, day and night, to get to some village, which I know, don't know the name now. So there he left me with the family. And then uh, six months I lived with them because there was agreement with India and Pakistan that whoever I was left in both countries, they should be recovered and brought back to the respective countries. They came and I about 9, 30, 10 o'clock. My uncle's cousin who was there told me what my father's name and my uncle's names and all that. So then I was kind of was satisfied that he's he knows the family, so he'll be okay to go with. So I got into the refugee camp and my uncle, he came because he was 30 miles away in a town called Kasur. So he came from there every day to look for us. My uncle didn't realize what I needed, that all I needed was hugged and loved and uh, be assured that I'm safe now. Then when I was 12 year old, then my life changed. Uh, I met my friend. With him, I found that I belong to somebody. And I was not alone anymore. What my friend taught me, I forgave to the even people who killed my family. My own uh, way of uh, thinking is that just love everyone, hate no one. That's where I look at it. Okay, um, so like I said, this is um, one of the many, many videos that um, the archive has kind of made available on their YouTube site. Of course, they cannot make all stories available. Some stories have really graphic content. are also uh, uh, stories of perpetrators of violence who commit to having killed people in on video, on camera, so they don't have permissions to do that. But instead, so what the archive does in that, in that case is um, so I'm trying to pull up the the presentation. Give me one second. Yeah. Right. Um. So is that the archive has then partnered with um the Stanford Libraries um of Stanford University, and they have a spotlight exhibition of 51 stories that explores the personal sort of stories of partition, right? So also interestingly, they use the term personal here, uh, sort of also the consequences of such a project in a sense. So the 50 on stories, and this is a screenshot of the of the first page, so it's accessible to everyone. So you can log, you can like just search for this and you can you'll be able to see the stories. But interestingly, out of the 51, which is also like a sort of set, right? Like it's a representative set of all the stories. So it's also very heavily, se carefully selected what stories that they want to kind of make accessible to the public at this point. Uh, only uh, 30 are open access. Um, sorry, rather 21 are open access. So you can log in right now, see those two to three hour interviews of these various people from around the world. Um, and they, all the stories come from like 12 countries like India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, of course, US, UK, Canada. Spain, Israel, also wherever you have people who witness partition want to share their story, they've, they've gone and recorded it. But um, 30, uh, 21 stories are open access, but 30 are not publicly available. It's only available to uh, researchers or people who would apply for research in the archive. Um, so for instance, I managed to kind of get access to that. So I'm analyzing actually uh, 25 stories out of this 51 for my dissertation. Um, so it's also interesting to watch these stories. There are currently no transcriptions or translations available with each of the stories. So also they're, uh, they're not just recorded in English, of course. They're recorded in 22 languages. Like for instance, there's one story that's recorded in this language called Torwali. That is a very specific dialect spoken in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, 
which is sort of the that where the dardic tribes uh, live in north northern pakistan so it's also a, a um, dialect that's only spoken by very few maybe thousands at this point so uh, to find translations for that and the archive hasn't done that work yet uh, because of funding or whatever reasons so also sort of for me interestingly because i'm looking at borders i think there are borders that emerge in discursively in these ways too right who is the one then who can access these stories who is this knowledge being stored for who um, who is consuming these stories who's able to do that right so this archive and these public um also the promise of digitality right like ease of access you're able to access and learn about you know histories that you might not have learned before also maybe like the, these archives are um um seen in direct opposition to uh, state uh, official authoritarian archives but then again there are several borders that emerge linguistically uh, religiously and so in many ways within these archives so for me those are also interesting things to look at and think about um a little boring part just the theoretical framing and research practices that um determine or are guiding the dissertation at this point of course post colonial theory is very key to understanding the entire project memories uh, and borders again becomes one of the, they are the two um, key theoretical anchors for framing the entire dissertation in terms of research practices of course it's a rhetorical dissertation so rhetorical analysis is key um and like i mentioned i just showed you a couple of slides before the three projects that make up the digital oral, oral history archive are my sites of analysis alongside the i'm like i mentioned i'm accessing i mean um, analyzing 21 oral histories out of the 51 present in the stanford collection i'm also um interviewing um, sort of people so uh, qualitative methods in using semi structured interview in questionnaires also is a part of the research practice and i'm only doing 15 interviews um six are going to be with architects or curators of the three archives or people sort of who um have our owners or they call themselves in several ways like citizens archive of india uh, the person who heads it now calls them and the ceo of the archive so several ways to also refer to themselves and then nine interviews are going to be with oral historians um or who are like collecting these memories or something that i did in 2015 too so like people like me who have volunteered their time somebody has won a fellowship and is doing this so there are also various ways in which people are contributing to this oral hist oral history work um now in terms of analysis um what's interesting and what sort of is emerging at the moment um is uh, I'm trying to also engage with border rhetoric and seeing how borders in in various forms are obviously engaged by rhetorical studies but also I think the push here is to develop uh, and see if hopefully that that happens in the next few months is this idea of the digital border rhetoric or borders in digital rhetoric and we'll see sort of uh, how that happens but I'm trying to think through these ideas because i think analyzing the relationship between memory and border especially in the digital landscape does allow for an analysis like this to happen um and like i mentioned earlier um of course the notion of borders as we know is super critical to partition at the same time uh, re like li religious linguistic regional borders that were created sort of also continue to persist in many ways this like the project is promising you like hey you can transgress this border cross you know uh, cross the open frontier and see home but even within that the discursively at least like these borders do continue to emerge and play out in many ways um so in the research i'm also trying to develop the temporal nature of borders in order to sort of further solidify their relationship that borders share with memory and especially that might happen in a multidirectional way in the digital realm right so like borders influence memory memory influences border in up in, in various ways um then also like i said uh, the relationship between borders and memory that is that exists in the digital oral history archive tempor in a temporal way in a spatial way especially spatiality becomes interesting to think about in a digital space how does that look like um and lastly i think uh, the form of oral history in itself needs to be further thought through because if we are only go at, like the 1947 partition archive adopts the model of crowdsourcing uh and they say that you know um as long as you have access to an internet you know they give out these they conduct free oral history workshops by monthly so if you uh, attend one of those workshops they'll certify you as a citizen historian in the framing is also interesting that citizen historian sort of borrowing from citizen journalist and then if you uh, attend the workshop you have access to an internet and somebody who's witness partition and is ready to give you an interview you can go uh, go interview them using their 
expansive questionnaire, which is about 100 pages long with 79 questions, which is huge. And for those of us who, who are invested in oral history work, have seen it also in other projects, we know that at least in the non digital uh, oral history space, that was not how that was happening. So interestingly, breadth over depth becomes important for these projects. So it's more about numbers and even the projects, how they're rhetorically positioning themselves is like time is running out. You know, these people are now in their late 80s, early 90s. There's sort of this push urgency to collect, collect more and more and more. So that's also interesting then to think about what hap what is happening to the form of oral history here. The singular story, what's happening to that? Um, and lastly, sort of coming to the library resources, um, we uh, I think uh, we have a brilliant collection of South East Asian sort of resources. One is it's very uh, renowned and widely known uh, at OU. We have that collection, but within that uh, we don't have as much maybe for the South Asian uh, resources and that also uh, maybe for us, you know, who study uh, who are invested in archival work, in library work, work in the libraries, absences also become important to think about in collections. Then, um, so for instance, if you key in South Asia in the in the library website, you'll come across 6,070 results and about 1,200 for partition. Now, partition, of course, also has such a varied South Asian in the context of South Asia. Partition is usually referred to with a cap uh, with capital P, but also we know partitions have happened elsewhere around the world and also at the same time, right? Um, so again, we have about 1200, but those are valuable sort of resources, but at the same time, it's not as vast as collections go. Um, but at the same time, as, at least for my work, uh, my work is extremely interdisciplinary and I'm sure you must have a sense of that by now. I'm borrowing heavily uh, from geography, sociology, anthropology, besides just thinking about rhetorical studies and communication studies. So that also helps in a way um, to sort of go into the into the library and think about more resources and that adds to the work. Um, just sort of a future direction of where this work might go. Um, so of course the hope is to publish theoretical essays that further our sort of collective understanding of public memory and borders in the digital landscape. Then uh, the, the second sort of idea is to publish more conceptual essays that further uh, think through the idea of the digital border rhetoric or borders in digital rhetoric and kind of really solidify that idea. Um, and also because in, in the context of the presentation today, if you're thinking really seriously about how this research might be useful for like librarians, archivists, we also have see are seeing more such projects emerge. So the partition is one context in which digital archives are emerging. We also have the Palestinian oral history archive, which is very interesting, currently housed in the American University of Beirut, which is also doing similar work. Then there's another very big uh, oral history sort of push happening in the South African context. And then there's South African oral history archive, which is again independent people's archive, people's participation. So again, thinking that this is not just in one context it's happening. So we're seeing more and more sort of these projects come up, um, which I think might be useful for future direction of the work. Um, with that, thank you very much. Um, I hope this was useful in some way, and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to think through more about my work. And uh, yeah, I'll pass it over to Jen now. Thank you, Ritika. Uh, at this point, we'll open it up for audience questions. Um, if you would like to use the raise hand feature, you're welcome to do so. If you'd prefer to type your question in chat, I'm happy to moderate. Um, while you all are thinking of your questions, I am going to put a link in the chat to just a brief survey about today's presentation. If you wouldn't mind um, taking a moment and filling that out, especially if you're here as part of a Guarantee Plus milestone, you'll want to fill out that and let us know that for sure. So we'll, we'll wait at this point to see if we have any questions from our audience. I'm not seeing any questions today. I think you were very, very thorough, Ritika. Either that or it was absolutely <laughs> nothing got conveyed. So 
Oh wait, all right, we have one. Okay, so uh, first we have a comment that that says you you did you had, it was an awesome presentation. So yay on that. Uh, and then Brandy Weaver has a question. Uh, she's wondering was the process to gain access to the restricted parts of the archive difficult? To clarify, uh, how much did you have to show that you were indeed an academic researcher and needed access? So that's a great question. So thank you, Simmer, for I think if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, thank you. Um, and uh, yes, so um, that's a great question in terms of gaining access. So like I said, I have ha I do also share a personal relationship with the archive since I've contributed to it. I've recorded 60 stories for them and worked in various capacities as a research development. Like I was doing fundraising at one point in my life, which I'm very terrible at. I honestly ma didn't manage to even raise a dollar for them, but I was doing that work for about 11 months. But um, yeah, in, in all honesty, uh, so for me it wasn't that difficult because I already know the people and this is really small, tiny team, right? Like there are barely three sort of fixed permanent members in the archive. The rest are all volunteers. So um, and then they, they also have a very good knowledge about my project. So because I've been talking about it for years, this is what I want to work on. So personally, for me, the process wasn't that difficult, but if for someone who isn't familiar with the archive, the archive isn't familiar with them. They do have many checks and sort of balances in place. There is a long form that you have to kind of fill up, get and you have to be a part of a university. So again, that's that sort of restricts access. So for independent researchers, I think the process is different, but for academic researchers, um, you also need a letter of support from your advisor. You need a, a sort of le additional letters from people if you're getting sort of um, other you know sort of uh, external grants you need to also show that and then you have to answer about 10 15 questions in in various ways basically describing your research and what you're going to do with it and uh, every time you use anything from the archive of course as uh, protocol would go you have to credit them from a picture to a story anything that you do so yeah for me the process was easy but at the same time it's not the same for everyone yeah Great, thanks for that. Uh, we do have another question from um, Nick Versteeg. Nick would like to know, uh, might you be able to speak more about the diaspora over or under representation in oral history projects? Yes, that is a really good question. Um, so in terms of, like I said, all the projects that are being run right currently are also uh, most of them, not all, but most of them are, have been undertaken by the di South Asian diaspora. And by South Asia, then I mean anybody from India, Pakistan or Bangladesh and other countries. But at the same time, India is also centered within that notion of South, South Asia, just to kind of like put in a caveat there. But uh, in terms of overrepresentation or underrepresentation, it's interesting because, um, of course, nobody has been able to analyze the archive in its entirety. Nobody has sat down, or at least I don't know of any work that exists in the current moment where somebody's gone in all of these archives and looked at each and every story and seen, you know, like who, who is being represented most in the archive and so on. But at least in the 51 stories that I'm analyzing, um, there are there is reasonable diversity. But again, that's a snapshot of the archive, right? So it's also curated in a certain way to make sure that you're getting a, a sense of all all voices. So there are trans people that are included in the archive. Um, in, in in South Asia, we have a very rigid caste system, which is uh, which many of you may already be familiar with, which is sort of very similar to a you know if I had to make a comparison, um, a near comparison would be like the racial system, right? So you have a very uh, the caste system divides social hierarchy in a certain way. So you have a lot of representation from the upper caste communities, upper classes, you know, people refugees who are even alive to kind of tell their story today. Um, so it's interesting in that sense. Also, um, are there more Hindus in the archive? Are more Muslim story stories being represented? So that kind of analysis, I think, will require more in-depth study of the archive, really. And at some point, hopefully, someone's going to take, oh, you know, take up that project and really look. Or maybe I might take it up if I get some kind of really great funding and years to do it. But really look through all the stories and think about that. But at the current moment, if I had to sort of tell you from those 51 stories, there is diversity. But at the same time, there is also overwhelming sense of like um, in terms of like caste and class, definitely there is some sort of lopsided representation there. As one would assume. Great, thanks Ritika. So I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. Oh, 
Um, Janet Holmes has excellent presentation and she does have a question. Can you talk more about the extensive questionnaire you referenced for the oral histories and the problems associated with that for the researcher and or the archive itself? Right, um, thanks Janet, but also um, yes. Um, so in a typical oral history project, uh, or at least like, you know, we do have like a whole sub-discipline dedicated book and researchers have spent a lot of time thinking about the form of oral history, how that would look like, the commitments of oral history and so on. So it's not typical to use a 100 page questionnaire with 79 questions on it to interview one person. It's very extensive in that sense. One of the reasons that, uh, and this is of course also um, emerged in the interview that I've conducted. One of the reasons for that is because it's people like who have absolutely no training in such work, uh, academic training or any kind of like training field work uh, experience who are conducting this research. So they really need a lot of hand holding. And so that's the reason for these extensive interview uh, questionnaires. Uh, like I said, it's not typical. So if a typical uh, somebody, let's say from the academy, right, was doing this kind of work, was conducting an oral history project, they would have about close to, let's say, 12, 15 ma main questions around the um, the event that you want to ask or like which kind of is shaping up your research. But those questions also tend to meander, right? Like that's all the nature of oral history. You go from one point A to C to F and then you come back to D and that's also how memory works. So it's not like very linear in that sense, but the way the archive questionnaire is the story becomes linear because you ask right for the first question is like, what's your name? What was your parents name? You know, where did you grow up? So it's taking you from the moment of your, whatever you remember about your childhood from school, from what did you eat? What did you wear? You know, um, questions about um, were you living in an agrarian society? Were you living more in an urban place? How was what were the materials used to build your house? Uh, what games did you play as a child? Who were your friends? So taking right from that to then arriving at the moment of partition, it's a slow process and then taking the uh, the interviewee after partition. What happened? How did you migrate? How was life after migration? What do you do currently, right? Like the entire journey. So like so there are both issues that emerge from such a process, but they're also like they have their reasons for doing that is because people are doing this on a volunteer basis, right? It's like people who have zero sort of training and are just sort of doing this probably for the first time. And they also don't have really any age limit on doing this. So you could also be as young as 16, 17, doing this work with your grandparents. So if you have if you have a grandparent who's witnessed partition, you could take this training, the oral history, um, like free training and be certified to do this uh, work by the archive and then, you know, uh, deposit the story with the archive. So that also happens and they have had, uh, I mean, I was doing this interview with one of the founders and they were telling me that some of the oral historians are as old as 88, right? So people of their generation interviewing so like a husband wanted to interview his wife and they both had witness partitions. So it was also interesting in that sense. Um, so yeah, I, it's a great sort of document for rhetorical analysis. Um, and over the years also, the archive has been extremely receptive to feedback. So I don't exactly know who all contributed, but from the sense of it, academics have contributed in the making of this questionnaire. People, partition scholars, cultural commentators, oral historians. So it's not just like this one process, right? This one person decided that this is how it should look like. It's been a community effort in that sense. But at the same time, they've also been very open to revising it and feedback. So some of the times they were telling me that, you know, there have been many, many versions of this questionnaire. So the questionnaire that they were probably using in 2010 when they started off was a very small questionnaire, but over a period of time, they've expanded it to these hundred, this hundred page questionnaire. So it's been also in that sense. But I, I, my sense is that the archives reasoning for it has been because people do require that kind of sense of direction to do this work, especially for people who have zero experience or are doing this for the first time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ritika. I think at this point we will say thank you to our audience uh, and especially thank you, Ritika, for, for your wonderful presentation. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you everyone for spending a little bit of time with us this afternoon and I hope you all have a great day.